Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And welcome to our daily devotional. As you may know, this week we have in Dick Shamins uh, sharing uh, on the letter of Paul's letter to Philippians. So yesterday we had his first message. Today we're going to have the, the second message. If you miss it for any reason, you just go to our Grosvenor Church Barnesville YouTube channel. Uh, all, uh, all daily devotional is being recorded. And then you can just watch uh, the message from yesterday. And also you can uh, uh, send a message to, to anyone else, friends, family, brothers and sisters in Christ. You say, whoa, maybe it would be good for you to watch uh, this message or whatever God put in your heart. Okay. Also, we're going to have uh, Jackie Elmore sharing a beautiful worship song with us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning, this new day. Thank you for always your protection, always your blessing us, you covering us. Thank you very much for our brother Jake and for his disposition to be sharing this week with us and teaching us the Bible. Give us an open heart, open mind to receive it from you through our brother. So also pray for revelation, Lord. Revelation from you, Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Hello, everybody. If you've got your Bibles there, perhaps you would turn with me to Philippians in chapter 1, and we're reading at verse 3. I thank my God every time I remember you, says Paul. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart and whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best it may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. Paul says, Paul says, I pray with joy. Joy has to do with deep feelings of pleasure and delight and happiness and gladness. It's to do with inward peace. It's to do with, it's to do with that um, sufficiency that's not affected by outward circumstances. And it's a joy that can't be mustered up. It has to be a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's the Lord's joy we're talking about. It's the joy that Nehemiah talked about when he was celebrating with God's people. And he reminded them that the joy of the Lord is their strength. Joy and rejoicing. You, you, you have to get used to this word because it crops up so many times, 14 or 15 times in the letter. And he prays and he thanks God because of your partnership your fellowship in the gospel. And here we've got a big word which we need to look at just for a moment. It's the, the word fellowship, it, it's, um, it's a mighty word and its background is in the business world. I want you to imagine just for a moment a couple of disciples of the Lord Jesus going down to the local market to do their shopping and they come across a couple of men who are standing very animatedly talking to each other nose to nose and one is saying to the other something like, if you promise to invest all your cash and put all your resources and all your time and all your energy into this project, and I promise to do the same thing, this will work. This business deal will take off. And they agree. And then they, as the disciples watch them, they walk over to the end of the marketplace where a man is sitting with um, paper and pens in his hand and he's the local scribe and they come and they dictate the deal to the scribe. And when they've finished, the scribe says to them, what shall I call this? And they said, we'll call it, we'll call it fellowship. We'll call it partnership. I can imagine the disciples dashing back home to the other disciples saying, we just heard a word down in the market that describes us. It's the word fellowship. It's 
it's it's a big big word because of the connection with uh, the the business world uh, i i looked up on google to see how the modern business world viewed the word the word partnership i found this quite helpful all the parties involved have a personal stake in the partnership all the partners are working together towards the common aim there is an understanding of the value of what each partner can contribute. There's no hierarchy of ministry. There is respect and trust between the different partners. They share creativity, risk, responsibility and resources. Partners are able to feed off each other's energy and enthusiasm. <laughs> now that's a secular world for you. How much more should that relate to the body of Christ? Yes, it's a big word. So we mustn't misuse it. Uh, for example, we should never say, let's go and have a bit of fellowship. There's no such thing. It's all or nothing. But then Paul comes to his prayer. And the first thing that strikes me about Paul's prayer is he actually remembers what he prays. Either he's kept a prayer journal, which I seem to doubt, or else he prayed this prayer so often that it was in his memory. Whichever way, it was so much superior to the sort of prayers that we pray sometimes. Oh, Lord, please bless Please bless the Philippians. And this is his prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. And again, we have to stop at this word abound because, again, it's a big word. It has the idea of a surging waterfall like Niagara. It means to be over and above the ordinary. And, of course, if you stand by a Niagara, you know jolly well it's over and above the ordinary. The Lord Jesus uses the word when he talked about abundant life i've come that they might have life and they might have it abundantly paul in other places talks about the abundance of joy abundance in hope abundance in the work of the lord abounding in salvation in, in thanksgiving uh, sharing in god's comfort i don't think we can do without the word because it so describes so much of the the gospel over and above the ordinary but here it's abounding love. This love that is over and above the ordinary. Well, I guess that means loving like Jesus, doesn't it? But Paul adds a, a solemn footnote there because he says that it should be dispensed with knowledge and depth of insight. In other words, although this love is overflowing and extravagant and abundant, you should be careful how you share it because it's such a precious commodity. The message puts it beautifully. So this is my prayer, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much, but love well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent and not sentimental gush. And why should our love be like that? Why should it abound in knowledge and depth of insight? It's, it's so that we might know certain things. First of all, that we might know what is best, what is God's best, and that we would be, the next thing is that we would be pure. The idea behind this word is to stand the test of sunlight without impurity appearing. If you're of a certain age, you will remember the adverts for Purcell where the young housewife is holding up her husband's pristine white shirt to the sun to test whether it was washed properly. The authorised version uses, instead of the word pure, the word sincere. And this has a history to it. It's lovely. When the Romans conquered the Greeks and came back home triumphant, they brought with them examples of the beautiful sculpture that the Greeks were famous for. And all the rich Roman families wanted items for their own back gardens. Back in Greece, the artists uh, began to feverishly keep up with demand and just occasionally in their workshop, they, uh, they made mistakes in their work and they had to ask themselves, what shall I do? Shall I start again? And the answer was usually no. What they would do is to cover up the mistake and they did it by daubing wax in the crack that they'd made with their chisel. When the statue got back to Rome, it would be installed in a beautiful garden for everybody to admire. And of course, when the sun came out, the wax melted and dribbled down, leaving a gaping hole. And the Roman government were very firm and they insisted that from now onwards, nothing would come in from Greece unless it carried 
the trademark, which was in Latin, sine sira, without wax. Paul is saying, in effect, that where Christians are concerned, there is no place for waxing up the mistakes. What you see is what you get. No covering up our blemishes and hoping that no one will notice. But then he says that uh, we should be pure and blameless. Never cause anyone to stumble. That's what that means. And of course, Paul would have probably remembered what the Lord Jesus said. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung round their neck and be cast into the depths of the sea. And then Paul says, for the day of Christ. Now, sadly, we've got no time to talk about that this morning. Suffice it to say that Paul's whole life looked back to the incarnation and all that that introduced, salvation, new life and the rest. But it also looked forward to what he says when he writes to Titus, that blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Father, God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And then finally he says that we may be filled with the fruit of righteousness. Of course, this probably harps back to Paul's word to the Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And then whatever. The aim will always be just one, in that it's to the glory and praise of God. And of course, this makes life so uncomplicated. We never have to worry about our motives for doing something because it's always going to be to the praise and glory of God. Before writing even one note, uh, J.S. Bach, the, the renowned uh, composer, carefully formed the letters at the top of his manuscript, J.J. It was in Latin, Jesu Juva, Jesus help me. And when he finally was satisfied with his work, at the bottom of the manuscript he wrote, S-D-G, Soli Deo Gloria, for the glory of God alone. Whatever you do, says Paul in another place, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now a little blessing from Philippians. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God bless you. Bye-bye.
Thank you very much, Dick, for your second message. And thank you very much, you, for getting connected with us. We hope to see you in Albetiza tomorrow, half past 10, for Dick Chamin's third message in Philippians letter. So God bless you. Have a nice day. In Jesus' name. Bye. Bye. Amen.